Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga and Six Day. I want to introduce you to a very impressive lady who uh, who comes from us, uh, comes to us from Moscow, and now uh, resident in Toronto. And she uh, travels uh, uh, to New York and other places because she is a, a very good um, uh, psychologist. Uh, she has got a PhD. Uh, she's a communication relationship coach. She's an etiquette expert. She's an art consultant. She's an entrepreneur, and uh, she's recently uh, launched a, a program for uh, children, uh, for teenagers on leadership. And it's uh, all about success. And she goes through a whole bunch of different things that uh, one needs to do to achieve success. And the, and the list is kind of interesting. She talks about body language, self-confidence, storytelling, communication, personal image, public speaking, stress management, dancing and acting. Sounds like a fantastic program for me, let alone for teenagers. Uh, I wanna introduce you to Naria, and I'm gonna get your name wrong, I apologize, Volumaya. Volumian. Volumian. Naria Volumian. Dr. Naria Volumian. Welcome to our show. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much, Brian, for inviting me and for letting me, you know, be your guest in this, uh, on this wonderful day, Thanksgiving Day. It's beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, so tell me, how did you get into becoming a psychologist? Um, you know what? Uh, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a long way, and everyone who tells that they just come to psychology, to, into psychology to support only others, I don't believe in this story, because usually we come, uh, we start, uh, our passion in psychology starts from something about us. You know, there is a term which is called wounded healer, and I believe that you heard it before, so it's... Wounded, wounded, wounded healer. healer. Okay, what does that mean? So this term was created by Carl Gustav Jung, and I'm Jung Jung therapist as well. So it means that our own wounds bring us into psychology, and only after we are able to heal our own wounds, we can help others. Usually this process goes hand in hand, so helping others, we grow ourselves as well. So my path into psychology, I think, was determined by my childhood. I uh, come from, uh, so I'm a child of divorce. My parents divorced when I was three years old. And at that time, I became, I became an adult. I was- uh, you became taking, an adult at three years old. I think so. I think really? so. Because my parents, they were young. They were busy with their life, with establishing themselves young, they were 24 years old, 24, 20, 24, 25. So they were establishing themselves. And I, uh, I know that they did not wish me to become an adult, but this is how I felt. I was taking care of myself. I was responsible for myself, especially I went to kindergarten and to the school five days a week, five days kindergarten. And then when I moved to school, it was six days a week. It means that I haven't seen my, I, I didn't see my parents for, I, I, I met my mom only once or twice a week. My father moved to another city. So I stayed with my mom in Moscow. My father moved to St. Petersburg. And that's why I was by myself at the age of three. And everything what I went through, all my challenges, I was the one who supported myself. For sure, I had friends, but I was an introvert child. And I was not... Uh, a person who shared a lot, especially ch about challenges and problems that I had. I never tell, told every, anyone that I have something difficult in my life. So I was, I, I was by myself. And I think mostly it influenced my choice of psychology. And my first education uh, was, uh, I, I'm a lawyer by my first education. And um, uh, so, um, I, first, of all, I, first of all, I married young. I married at the age of 16. And I think you that- You married I, at the age of 16, really? So you sort of follow in your mother's footsteps? No, no. My mother, I think, married- uh, No, no, no. Not, not because of this. My mother did not marry young. She was a student in the university. She was, she was 22 years old when she had me. And uh, I married young because I think I was always looking for father's figure in my life. Right. I needed someone and my husband was older than, uh, than me for 12 years. And he taught me everything. He taught me how to be a woman, how to be, you know, just how to, um, how to develop business. I mean, he, he, he played father role in my life. He even went to school because I still was a school girl, an excellent student with the 
dreams of my parents for me to become a politician or someone else, but I, I fell in love. So I married and I did not go to university. We had two kids. I was dreaming about having six. I liked my life of housewife, cooking everything at home. It was just my, uh, my small world. As an introvert, I enjoyed it. And, but my, at the age of 23, my husband was murdered. So I stayed with two kids of three and five years old and all my dreams were broken. Oh my God, he was married. I'm so sorry. What, 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 yeah. what happened? Yeah, business money. You know, it was wild 90s in Moscow. So it was a common story, you know, in many families. Oh, really? Yes. And you see, it's, this story happened with me. And so at the age of 23, I had to... 23, change. you're a widow. You've got uh, two kids. What did you do? I started my own business. Which was? Uh, it was, so uh, it, uh, within half a year, I opened my first hardware store. Then I opened second one in another half a year that I had car repair service. Then I had a small factory of chroming. So I was opening businesses by businesses. And only as a psychologist, I know what I was doing. I was coping with my grief. I was... Um, I, I wanted to be so tired just not to think about what happened in my life, not to think the moment, you know, so my day ended up, you know, I went to bed and it was a second, I closed my eyes and slept. And during the day, I was so busy, so occupied that I did not have time just to, to be sorry for myself. Uh, and at that time, I uh, went to law school, I needed it for my business. And I, um, it, it, added something, you know, so I was too, too occupied. And when I finished, when I graduated my law school, I, I was an intern. I was supposed to become criminal lawyer. And uh, I went to the, to the court one day and I saw there was a case of four teenagers who stole something small. But because it's a group crime, because uh, stealing, it does not matter how much, it influences only how many years of prison you will get. So they each got eight years. And I was crying. They, they came from dysfunctional family. I, was, I think I was connected with what happened with them because as a kid, I was by myself as well. Yep. And I attached, so I cried for a few days and I did not. I realized that I don't want to be involved into this system of punishment. Just, I don't believe in it. And I thought, you know, what can I do? And psychology was the best solution, I think, because I can do something for people before they get into trouble, before they, you know, they, they will do something that will change their life forever. Because this, um, I've been in prison because I had some clients and I started my career. So I knew what, what, will, what, will, be, what will change in their life. And I knew that, you know, for some of them, it will change. The trajectory of their life will change forever. So I, 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 was, I, I, I didn't like it. And that's how I became a psychologist. So but then you went back to school for psychology after completing a law degree. Yes. Yes, really fascinating. And uh, and because of these four kids that uh, ended up in uh, in prison for eight years, you decided you could do better than put them in jail by trying to solve their problems. I did. And uh, you know what? So that's why it's one one explanation of my getting into psychology. Another one, I'm telling you, I have my personal issues as well. And who knows what brought me what exactly brought me into psychology? What a fascinating story. And uh, and now you're trying to help and you have been for a long period of time obviously but now trying to help people uh so let's um take a break for some messages and come back more with naria dr naria volumayan is that correct you know what i ear naira naira yes and you don't uh, don't tell doctor i'm fine with naira i'm still that girl you know just without all these degrees and everything we're gonna take a break for some messages and come back with naira in uh, just a minute uh, stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Second Eight Sixty. We're chatting with uh, Nayera, uh, Doctor Nayera Velunia, L L L L sorry, Velu Mayan, um, who is a psychologist um, from uh, from Russia originally. She now lives in Toronto, uh, makes her business in Toronto, has a, uh, a clinic uh, in North York, uh, and. Um, and she's developed a program for children, for teenagers on success. And, uh, and it's really quite interesting. Tell me about, uh, it's called um, the, uh, 
uh, where, where's the name here? It's called the Academy of Social Competency. Fascinating. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to teach teenagers how to become socially competent. Absolutely. I thought about things that helped myself as an introvert to be visible, to be in public, to feel comfortable, to be confident. And uh, I struggled and I thought that uh, why, should, why should kids grow up and struggle? So there should be a solution that can help develop special skills so they can be successful in life. Especially now world requirements are that you should be loud, visible, promote yourself. It does not matter where you do, do you go, on a date, on a job interview, promoting, speaking about your business. So everywhere you should be confident and impressed and uh, uh, create, deliver the content that you have because I believe that everyone has a message. Everyone has this content, this sparkle, and the thing is just how to bring it to others. How Everyone to Everyone has a message. You believe that. Everyone has a message, a sparkle. I do. I do. That's a great positive attitude. But, you know, I think um, a lot of what you're suggesting, though, applies to everyone, not just to teenagers. Yes, uh, I agree. So teenagers maybe are just the beginning and I have my other programs for adults. I have online programs. I have about 70 online classes for uh, self-confidence, uh, conflict resolution, communication, building relationships, uh, about happy relationships and couples, effective com professional communication and relationships between adult children and their parents. So I have something for adults now well, I think for everyone <laughs> yes i tried that's interesting because what you say in your uh, in your intro is that the key is not hard work which of course is important but the mastery of relevant skills so you think these <laughs> skills are, are are critically important that we have in addition to just working hard Absolutely. Look, if you have, if we, if we agree, and it's not only, by the way, my belief that everyone has a sparkle. I, I'm witnessing this every day. So I know this for sure. It's, and you know, now we, if we agree that everyone has a sparkle, everyone has a message. Now the question is how to deliver this message to people. And we need special skills to, de to deliver it. For example, look, if you write a letter to someone, then you need uh, Canada Post or other services to deliver something that you wrote or created to deliver it to their uh, recipient, right? It's the same way it works here. So we have a message, we have a sparkle, and now we should deliver it. And what other skills that can help us to do this. And I thought about a list of skills and they are body language, communication, personal image, self-confidence, stress management, public speaking, storytelling, dancing and acting. And dancing and acting here, not in terms of becoming an actor or a dancer, but how to get connected with your body, how to involve all your body in delivering your message, how to feel comfortable and how to impress. Um, sounds uh, like quite the uh, impressive list. Let's talk about each one of them. Body language. Tell me about body language. Why is it important? And what is positive body language? So body language is the first skill that is included in this program. First of all, I will have nine coaches. And uh, each coach will be responsible for their own, because they are experts in their own area, and they will teach. So I will be... Uh, teaching body language. And I will be first, so I will be the first because I will, it's a great opportunity for me to know about each participant of the program, each student. And second, it's the easiest way to start working with shy and um, introverted uh, students. Why? Because body language is nonverbal. You don't have to say anything. All you have is your body and you should establish connection throughout your body, throughout your facial expressions, your gestures, your posture, your distance, your eye contact, and your intonations. Uh, therefore, you know, I will, what I will do during the first months, I will ask kids, I will not ask them to speak. I will ask them to position themselves, to express their emotions and their states throughout their nonverbal cues, why it's uh, another, another idea that was behind including body language and starting with body language. When we were kids, we were non-verbal. Yep. And 
uh, this is how, you know, it's just, it's a growth. And that's why nine months, nine months is a birth, is a period, you know, after which, which a baby, um, another, you know, a new creature comes to the world, right? So that's why it's, it's very symbolic for me. Okay, that it sounds fantastic. Give me some suggestions. So what is it? Just sitting up straight? What, what, what do you teach with body language? First of, all, look, first of all, sitting straight is very good for your digestion, right? It's oh, really? Very- I didn't know that. Yes. Yes, because you know you allow your, all your organs to breathe, right? Just to, to 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 function. What else? With your posture, you create impression. If I will sit like this, you know, you probably will ask Naira, do you have pain somewhere, right? So, no. if I will sit like this, you will understand. Even if I don't feel confident, you know, you will get the message that I'm fine, I'm relaxed. Another trick, you know, just for example, it's. Uh, you know, you probably notice that speakers, public speakers, they uh, use their gestures, like they're very big, right? They just, they move and they, you know, why? So there is a psychological, and I look at everything as a psychologist, at everything as uh, how to involve our brain work for us, but not against us. And at the same time, how to use all the theories and how to include them. So now they will become practical. So when they do these high movements, big movements, they move, you know what they show. So in nature, uh, you, you occupy the space and who occupies bigger space, you know, is more confident. Yeah. Who am I, a mouse, you know, just small, tiny, somewhere in the corner, always hiding. And now a lion, what lion does, you know, just comes out and just, you know, says to the, I'm here. I'm here, I own this place. Yes, that's why gestures, even you, if you don't feel confident, gestures should be big, you know, if you want to create an impression, absolutely. You know, all these, if you notice, you know, business people, they like doing this uh, subconsciously, I Putting believe. Putting their hands behind their head and leaning back. Absolutely. You know, it's a signal, a sign of confidence. I, I'm the king, right? Yes. And they put one, one leg on the other, you know, just it's like the world belongs to them. But sometimes that goes too far. I had a boss once that uh, would do that, lean back, and then he would put his shoes up on the desk in front of me. And I found that unbelievably insulting and arrogant. Too much. You know, that's why you look, speaking about gestures, there are uh, introverted, shy, you know, just gestures of non-confidence. And then, you know, there are elegant gestures. And if there are too much, they become vulgar. Yeah. Yeah. You see, and the line here, how, you know, where to be for sure, you know, I'm for elegance, you know, how to, how to establish yourself elegantly, you know, you putting your legs, it's too much, you know, it's like, it's like exaggerating. It's like, it's, it's, I agree with you. That's why we should be very careful with, with something with our nonverbal language. So, so like this idea about man spreading where guys, you know, would sit on the subway or sit in a, and you know, they're, they're leaning back and their legs are far apart and they're taking up as much space. Is that going too far? Is that being arrogant? I think it's not being too arrogant. You know, it's by the way, there is another, after being vulgar, there is another, there is sexual gestures you know sometimes you know just they subconsciously express their sexuality but i would say you know there is no what's interesting about body language there is no one solution if a person if a man sits like this it does not mean behind his head yes it's not it does not mean only one thing that's why we use it in a, a person should be congruent what they say what they, how they move, you know, how they express themselves. And all this creates a story about us. And speaking about body language, what else we will learn with the students, teenagers and uh, youth, you know, how to understand motives of others, not only express ourselves correctly, but right. how to understand, you know, what person would like to say. And here we speak about congruency because look, you can sit like this and then, you know, you can say, you know, I have many different doubts. I don't know how to do it. So, you know, doubtful message, a message about being doubtful and this posture, they do not work. Doesn't do fit uh, with your hands behind your head. It means that though the person who will receive your message will be, you know, just frustrated and will, it's not, it's not clear. So your body language has to be consistent with what you're saying. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. You're and, and is there secrets to, uh, you know, I guess what you're saying more often than not is that you want to be confident and you want to have body language that exudes confidence. Is that uh, like you're not teaching people to how to have body language that looks sad? I guess what you're doing is telling people to read body language um, and, and be empathetic for people that are sad or hurt or afraid. Is that correct? As well. 
And you know, so my, my first goal is to bring awareness that body language is part of us. Our body, you know, usually people operate, you know, just with their heads. Yeah. It's like, you know, other parts do not exist and you are not connected with your body. Yes, to let you know that everything what you do is a message, is something, Look, you can you can be you can sit. Um, I, I said you know like a, like a, like a, quietly like a mouse, but be aware that you create a message with everything what you do. You know, it's if interesting that uh, mm-hmm. I, I read a study once that showed that people around the world, all different cultures, all different languages, all different races, all smiled or frowned or cried, and smiling, frowning, crying uh, was something that we could determine within uh, a fraction of a second uh, on people's attitudes. And, you know, it's interesting that we all learned different languages, but, but we all innately learned smiles um, and they're all consistent. You know, nowhere in the world is a smile a negative. Uh, it's always a positive. And similarly, um, a, uh, uh, a confident stand up tall versus someone that uh, sort of makes themselves meek is something that worldwide people can determine um, from stick figures drawings about uh, whether someone is uh, confident. Now, a negative is that too often um, uh, teenage females uh, in, uh, in studies have, have determined that a confident stick figure is a male and a meek, weak stick fig- figure is a female. And so therefore, too often we've applied some, some sexism to, uh, to confidence versus and strong um, postures versus, uh, versus weak. You know what, my, my, uh, my thoughts about these um, weaknesses, strengths, masculinity, femininity are very simple. And, you know, here I follow um, the ideas of Sandra Bem, who I found uh, her research, I read a lot, and I, I, I even wanted to leave everything. She lived in the U.S. and wanted to move there and to, uh, to be part of her research, to be her, her student forever, because I share these beliefs. But then, you know, I learned that she passed away. So what's this about? It's about having both energy within us, masculine and feminine. It's the thing of 21st century. Look, in 20th century, 90s, it was easy. Are you a man? You are a woman, you know? It's just, so you have traditional belonging and that's it. It was easy. If you, if you are a woman, it means that you should include certain behavior, that's it. And find a man who will, com- who will bring something that you lack. Right, so bring his masculinity plus your femininity, nice couple. But now 21st century, it's very difficult. And that's why many people are frustrated. Now each of us, we have two energies, masculine and feminine. And now even looking for a partner, I mean, we go into another area, but looking for a partner, you don't, if I'm a woman, I don't look for masculine men because I have both uh, features. I'm looking for a partner who has again, masculine and feminine features. What does it mean? Look, masculine features leadership, assertiveness, making decisions, analytical skills, uh, taking, um, what else? So all these, you know, all this stuff that, you know, just traditional things. What is feminine? Feminine is following, accepting, embracing, um, uh, loving, uh, what else? Uh, following. And that's why, you know, each of us now, look, we have many women, by the way, you know, who are, who develop their masculine part and they are, they are great leaders. But when they come, come home, I think at home, you know, maybe their, their family needs some, something, something from their femininity, right? They need her just maybe just to, to switch into her feminine part, to embrace, to give, to be quiet, you know, just to be empathetic, feminine skills. And somehow many, we, and I have clients, many women, they cannot switch. There are other women who are very feminine. They're quiet, you know, they just follow their husbands and they, you know, they don't have their voice and you know, these Eastern cultures and they want to develop leadership skills, masculine skills. It means that, you know, now each of us, we are creatures now, we have both. And that's why, you know, speaking about even body language, weaknesses, strengths, look, we are both. That's why, stop fighting. It's just, for me, there is, there is no conflict. We're chatting with uh, psychologist Nadia uh, tonight about um, self-confidence, about posture, about leadership, about uh, success as a teenager and as an adult. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Nadia in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody.
Welcome back to the Brian Crabby Radio Hour on 2nd and 60. We're having a Thanksgiving Day special, uh, talking a little bit about uh, success and how to create success um, uh, with uh, psychologist Nadia Volumian, uh, Dr. Nadia, who is a psychologist uh, uh, in uh, Toronto, and she's got a program um, called uh, the uh, Academy of Social Competency for teenagers, but also a whole bunch of pro programs for uh, adults as well. And um, the first one we talked about was body language. Uh, and then in addition, what you talk about uh, is that successful people are confident about their goals and ideas. They are resilient and move forward despite challenges and failures. Nadia, tell me how you teach self-confidence. So first of all, Brian, I will not be the coach of self-confidence in this program. Uh, I told you that nine skills, nine coaches. And why the logic of the whole program is such that uh, participants will see different styles, will see different approaches, and will get different tools from different people. Look, I'm having clients, and during one to maximum three sessions, they feel comfortable with me. But the world does not consist only of Nairas. There are other people as well, and that's why I'd like to show them variety of, uh, of, of characters. And however, I have my opinion about self-confidence as well. And uh, what I think is just self-confidence, it's not only about delivering, it's about believing in the, in the value that you have inside. It's not and, about just delivering, it's about believing. Yes. So you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your ideas. You have to, you have to understand the value of yourself. You, you should feel it with each cell of your body, the value. Because look, we can start, we are, we are God creatures, you know. Our, our body and our inner world were given to us, right? We didn't, do, we didn't do nothing for this, right? We were just born, not even by our initiative, by the way. But we were given, you know, such, such a big thing, such a big gift, and you know just so how to find this self-confidence inside uh, especially going through childhood ki kids get different messages from their parents some of them are great you are great you can do everything but not all of, all of uh, kids get these messages some of them get messages don't go there because you know it's it's dangerous and it's fair because parents are responsible for kids uh, why did you do this you know, uh, for what kid can uh, per, for what kid can perceive is you know everything what you do just <laughs> it does not work, and we grow with all these messages and you know at the end we lose belief in ourselves. We are looking for authorities. We are looking for parental figures. I told you my story, right? And uh, that's why it's great. It's great if it will not be forever. However, some people follow others for the whole life because they did not find value in themselves. And here we speak about codependency, right? So when they, they attach to someone who is not worthy all the time, therefore we have many couples even, you know, many uh, unions, you know, where even professional, uh, when uh, employees suffer from their boss, what their boss is doing, but they cannot say, please stop. You don't have to quit. You just let your boss that you have boundaries and please don't cross these boundaries because, because I feel this, this, this. It's again, it's about being, having value and protecting your value. It's like, well, if you built a great house, if you put great values into your house, you know, maybe you should think about protecting it, you know, from intrusiveness, right? Of those who you who are not welcomed into your place. You still can invite guests who you like, but you still can tell to others, you know what, my place is not for you and it's fine. If you are not rude, if you are just, you know, if you are accepting that there is another person, you don't want to hurt anyone, but please, you know, just this place is just, you know, for, for, for someone else. So how do you, how do you find self-confidence? If, if, if you are, you're, you're suggesting that people are looking for authoritarian figures, they're looking for father figures, they're looking for guidance. How do you develop confidence in yourself? So I like, I like what you said, because initially you said how you find, and then you said how you develop, you know, so that's, you already answered your question, you know, because look, you can't you find it, you have to develop it. Absolutely. 
Yes, there is no way. If it will be so easy just to find it, you know, it will be it will be very simple and maybe the world would not need the coaches and psychologists for this. You go, you you learn where it is, you go, you take it, you find, so you bring it, you are, you are happy. And you know what, recently I, um, I'd like to tell about a person and uh, I believe that you know what this person created, but you never heard his name. Uh, I think so. So do you know who is Vitaly Buterin? No. No. Do you know cryptocurrency? Yes. Do you know Ethereum? Yes. Okay, so Vitaly Buterin is a creator of Ethereum. Okay. This person, I'd like you to, to read about him later. So if you look, he's 27 years old. He lives in Thorn Hill. He's Russian Canadian. He was brought by his parents to Canada at the age of six. He speaks Russian, English, and Chinese. He was a student of Waterloo. However, he did not graduate it. I think he left after two years. He is the person who meets presidents and just uh, successful entrepreneurs and lead the leaders you know all over the world. And if you will look uh, at him, you will see him. You will never. Um, you will never, you will never believe me that I'm speaking about. And he's a billionaire, you know. Just his net worth is just is, is huge. So, and at the same time, you know, he, he, his confidence is not about his body language, is not about his uh, presentation. He has content, and you know, this content is believing in what he's doing believing into the sparkle that he has and believing that this sparkle is very needed somewhere to someone. Believing and, in yourself, believing in your sparkle and believing your sparkle is needed. Yes, yes. There is someone who needs you, definitely. There is a person who needs you. I read, the, I read this great story about a, a student that uh, um, was failing out in school and was not doing well and was going to uh, drop out and quit and wrote uh, the SAT uh, exams in the United States and ended up scoring in the 95th percentile um, and was shocked uh, when uh, they got the results that uh, they were in the 95th percentile. And so they uh, reapplied themselves. They went to university, became a big success um, and, uh, and, and made a lot of money and created a, a great future for, uh, for themselves. And then about 10 years later, they were uh, um, sent a, a letter saying, actually 10 years ago, uh, we mistakenly sent you the SAT scores that uh, you actually scored in the 50th percentile. And, uh, and so this person had thought that it was the SATs that proved that they were smart that had changed them, but it wasn't. It was just their belief that they were smart. Wow. By the way, do you know the story of Einstein? I don't no. know if it's a real story or if it's a legend. So, you know, they, uh, one day he came from school and he brought a letter to his mother from the principal. And he gave this letter to his mom and she, she was reading and crying. He said, mom, what is there? She said, oh, you know what? They said that you're such a brilliant student and they want you to, take, to study at home because, you know, because their system is not good enough for you. And that's it. And he continued, you know, studying and just, and he, he became Einstein that we know. So, however, you know, years later, he found that letter. And it was written there that your kid has... Um, um, disabilities. He does not understand everything, what's going on at school. He cannot cope with the study process and please take him out of the school because he's, he is not able. Another story and uh, Winston Churchill and he's my role model. You probably know his story because you know he had speech impediment. He was given a forecast that he will not graduate school and he um, he's considered the greatest speaker of the 20th century. Unbelievable. Great, uh, great stories that prove that confidence, self-confidence is so critically important and you, and you teach it in your course. And then I, I love the next one you got. You talk about successful people are in active interactions with others. They communicate, collaborate, lead, ignite, network, engage, influence, and share. And so therefore you've got another section on storytelling and public speaking. Tell me about storytelling and public speaking and why it's so critically important. And how do you, how do you teach storytelling? Again, I have two great coaches for this. And public speaking was something that I struggled when I came to Canada. Um, I, I did not have these skills 
but to deliver my message, I had to do it. And I struggled. I remember when I was in Chicago and there were 300 people, the audience of 300 people, and the only wish I had that time just to escape and hide somewhere. I was so, it was so scary. For sure, I did not. And um, what, what helps, what helped me? First of all, great coaches helped me. They supported me. And the increase of, uh, uh, of challenges as well. So look, you start one-on-one. -on -one. And that's why we start here. Uh, group program starts in small groups of 12 participants and the coach. Then we change coaches, but it's not the only thing that we will have in the program. After nine months of this training, there will be three events organized for our participants with 50, 100 plus people where they will speak in front of a big audience on stage. So the challenge will increase. The first event will be uh, stage presence with home prepared speech. The second event will be improvisation where they will get piece of paper with the topic that they should prepare in three minutes and speak and engage the audience. And the third one will be teamwork debate. So how uh, coaches will do it, I have uh, great coaches. I mean, uh, the person, so um, the business process of this program, it's a non-profit uh, project, therefore, but that every money, and it's $120 per month from a parent. But what helps me to find great coaches, uh, 12 participants, $120 will create enough money to give to a great coach. Therefore, I can afford the best. And speaking about um, uh, storytelling is another part. You know, it's not only delivering, it's not only speaking in public, it's not only using tricks and uh, uh, setting a structure of your speech, but it's only about how you will do it, how you will fulfill it with impressions, images, uh, sounds, smells, colors. And uh, you know, you can speak about the forest. You can say, oh, I went to the forest yesterday. Or you can say, I went to the forest and I was listening to beautiful sounds of the birds. And you know, and then you can continue this. And then you will speak about uh, leaves, that, uh, about sound that leaves under your feet, you know, the sound that they created. You can speak about colors of, of the fall. Uh, leaves, especially our Canadian fall, is beautiful. And if you will bring these colors, you will say yellow, orange, red. And then, so you, with your storytelling, you can create like kind of a 3D picture. And it, hel it helps your listener get into the place where you've been, not into their forest that they, they know, you know, they, they go to the forest as well, but to the forest that you visited to have the, impre the, the, pers the impressions that you have. So this is fascinating. Is there a secret to storytelling? The way that you describe it, you're using intonation, you're using descriptive words. What, what's the secret to storytelling? The secret of storytelling, I would say, you know, the secret of storytelling is bringing your, the recipient um, to, into the picture, into your picture, so that they can feel it and experience it in full. Another one of the uh, sessions you have is on stress management. Tell us about how you manage stress. How I manage stress or what, what, what will we teach? How I manage how, stress. How do you teach people to manage stress? It's interesting. So in psychological schools, the first thing that they teach, if you want to become a psychologist, it's like if you want the same as if you want to go into martial arts, they teach you how to, how to fall not to, to break anything in your body, right? The same in psychology, they teach how not to burn out. That's why I think that stress management is number one. Because look, stress is everywhere and it will increase only. Uh, therefore, we should have this protection, mind protection. We should have the space in mind, in ourselves, where we can hide, where we can stay, uh, where we can be silent, and just process what's happening. And during this, um, the, these months, uh, with practicing these skills, we will, first of all, uh, explore strategies that help to cope with stress. Uh, 
simple strategies every day. You know what you should have in your pocket now. You don't have to have your, I mean, cell phone, cell phone for sure, you know, just is our, is our number one. What else you should have in your pocket? The list of coping strategies of what helps you to cope with stress. If you met someone who is just, who is disturbing you, who is just maybe too rude, too much, too just too loud, I don't know what, it depends what, what, what destroys your balance, you know? You go into your list and you say, okay, I should maybe breathe. Okay, maybe I should just distance. Okay, maybe I should just say to myself something, it's not forever. You know, you should have this list of uh, coping strategies. For example, look, when I go into states of, sadness and i do go you know because psychologists they have the same emotions as others they are even more sensitive than others but we know what to do with these emotions sometimes i have periods i have list of my movies list of my songs list of my places where i'd like to go so it's all my coping strategies it's uh, i mean coping to cope with stress therefore during this month we will explore individual coping strategies we will share uh something universal that helps to everyone. We will practice. Maybe some people like meditation, some don't, they feel anxious about this. Therefore, you should create your own bubble and you know, just jump into this bubble immediately when you feel unsafe or, or insecure. I have uh, 10 minutes in a hot tub, that works for me. Super, super. Everything works, you know. I don't say, no, come to me because it's a, if you found your recipe, just follow it. We're chatting tonight with uh, Dr. Nadia, who is uh, an expert uh, in uh, stress management, in uh, in body uh, posture, in uh, in confidence, etc. And has launched a program about social competency for teens. and uh, And the program is uh, is available. Uh, Nadia, if people want to find out about the program, is there a website that they can go to, or or what? The name of the website is Academy of Social Competency if you explore everything what is there, especially in the header, there is a link to this program for teenagers, which is called Smart Heads, Hats, Smart Hats Youth Program. Smart Hats Youth Program. Yes. And the Academy of Social Competency.com. We're going to take a break uh, for some final messages and come back with some concluding comments uh, from Nadia. And I'm going to ask her about acting and dancing and why that's part of her program in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm having a really interesting uh, conversation tonight with uh, Dr. Nadia Volumian, who is a psychologist. Uh, she runs a, uh, a psychology practice in North York in Toronto, um, and uh, she uh, um, works with uh, individuals, with uh, couples, uh, on relationships, uh, but she's also launched a program called the Academy of Social Competency, uh, a not-for-profit with teenagers, uh, for teenagers. And uh, she's got nine different coaches and they do a whole bunch of different programs. We've talked about some of them tonight. We've talked about uh, body posture. We've talked about self-confidence. Uh, we've talked about resilience uh, and dealing with stress. One of them or two of them that you've got on your list, Nario, were a little bit surprising to me. It was dance and acting. Why is acting and dance important to successful people? Acting. Acting is... Um, uh... I, I believe that it's important for everyone, not only for young people. As a psychologist, I took acting classes as well with famous Russian actor. And I think it helps a lot. First of all, it develops flexibility. So uh, the second uh, thing what it's doing, it's again, creates awareness in different roles that we, that we play in life. Uh, what does it mean? Some people believe that, you know, we should be consistent with everyone. But now imagine that you meet a three-year-old kid and you're consistent, you're serious, you know, just you have the spe special vocabulary. However, the connection between you and three-year-old kid will not be established. I even sometimes tell to my daughter because, you know, when she complains about my grandkids and she tells, oh, you know, I told you that my patience is broken. I said, look, first of all, what did you say? Did she understand what you said? My patience, does she know what is patience? She does not, because kids, they, can, they don't operate in this, uh, uh, with these words that can, they cannot touch. They grow, then they learn, you know? So even psychologically, they are not at that stage yet to understand what is patience. Can, can I touch it? Can I look at how does it look? 
Then, you know, you say it's broken. Now kid creates association. What can be broken? Uh, vase, uh, maybe balloon can be, right? Just uh, blown, blown, uh, blown, blown. I, sorry, help me with the terminology. Burst. A burst. bubble can okay. be burst. What, what else can be broken? You know, something, a toy can be broken. Then kid, now my patient, something that I don't know, is broken, something that usually, you know, just, uh, is very material and kid is lost okay it means that your message was about nothing but you're consistent and she said you know i speak with her as as so she can as an adult yes but does she get your message just, just you know you should then okay you meet someone who uh, never for example you speak about snow with a person who never Oh, just recent now i'm consulting a company and we are working with uh, uh, creating some development, uh, not development, just education and programs for nutritionists, for dietitians. And when they say, I told my client about proteins, and they said, look, but does your client know what is protein? I don't. It's not my area of expertise. I mean, I know because I read, because uh, I worked on work on my body, so that's why I know. But you should explain in very simple language what is protein to a person who you communicate with. That's why, you know, we should be aware about different roles that we play in life. And each role, if we will perform each role uh, perfectly, it will help us to be in any statement, in any, in any encounter, you know, provide the best. However, the biggest role is always to perform ourselves. And the biggest role is to perform ourselves. That's uh, ironic, isn't it? Okay, so what about dance? Why yes. is dance important? Dancing, because dancing, it creates, if acting helps you to create mental flexibility. Uh, dancing helps you to create body flexibility. It's the same, you know, when you move from slow to fast music. When with your movements, you can express yourself. Again, nonverbal. We start with nonverbal, the program. We finish with nonverbal because dancing is nonverbal. But now, when they have all the tools, now they will not only sit or show, they will move. They will move and express themselves, you know, just uh, with, with the music, with, um, their, with their plasticity. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you go to even if it's very practical uh, skill, imagine that you come to a dancing club and you try to say everyone, you know, how great you are, what you do in life, you know, but no one can hear you. No sound is so, so high. Then you go to the dancing stage and you start dancing and now everyone, you know, just, and you, you have, you have the attention. That's why, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful. It's very practical as well, just, you know, to create impression. Sometimes your one movement, you know, just can create much more than you say, you know what, I'm, I'm a person who would like to express myself. I'm a person who just who is confident, show this. And uh, did I? Did what I, a fascinating program you've got. The Academy of Social Competency. I love it. And uh, again, tell us where people, uh, if they're interested in the program, can, uh, can find it. It's called the Academy of Social Competency.com. Is that correct? Yes, another and hats. Head, head smart hats program. It's called smart hats program. And another thing, the fastest maybe way for these people just to connect with me. I, do do that? Many things that I'm involved in, many projects, but I will find time for everyone. Therefore, my, my number is 647-460-3430. You can find me on social media. There are different messengers. Thanks God, we have different sources of communication now. You can use any, anyone you like. Dr. Nadia Volumian, uh, psychologist. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm thankful, Brian, for you, uh, to you for inviting me. And I'm thankful to God, you know, for giving this possibility for us to enjoy the sun, to enjoy the food, to enjoy the, the fresh air, to enjoy just ourselves as well. And I'm thankful to everyone you know, who came into my life and who influenced the choices that I do now, the life that I live now. Wonderful, wonderful thoughts. And I'm thankful for uh, you. And I'm thankful for all the listeners that uh, come and uh, listen to me on a fairly regular basis. I'm on every Monday through Friday on Saga 960, 960 AM. Or you can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. 
at six o'clock, Monday through Friday. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Good night.